Well, Bobby and Beth happened to live in a neighborhood where there were some fellowship families. And over time, they began to hear those families' stories, their spiritual stories. Over time, they might have even been invited into a community group. They were definitely invited to their table for dinner. And over time, they be, at some point in time, both Bobby, who was a teacher, and Beth, who worked at Walmart, came to faith in Jesus Christ. Over time, they found a, a, a community group that really worked well for their schedules, and they began attending here at Fellowship, and their kids got involved, and their kids grew up here, and, and they, they began to lead community groups. And at some point in time, God began to lay on Bobby and Beth's heart this, this, this desire to, the world may know about Jesus. And after, after extensive training and extended training, Bobby and Beth went to be long-term missionaries, global workers in Southeast Asia. Many of you know who I'm talking about. Many of you support them and, and pray for them. And if you're new, you don't know who they are, but you wanna get to know them, don't you? This summer, they came back. One of their kids is attending college or starting college, and so they came back to visit, and Bobby was spending some time with our staff guys, and as he was sharing with us, he was just weeping, and he was weeping for their ministry. He was so excited about what God was doing in Southeast Asia and in their country in particular. He was so excited about this new ministry that his wife had there. And he, was, he, he said this, and it just struck me. He said, he said, I think it's possible in my lifetime that the, the country where they're working, that every people group might have someone that knows Jesus. And if you know anything about missions and global work, that's a really big deal. Hey, if you're new here, my name's John. I'm one of the pastors. I I'm a, I'm a, a work with our adult ministry, adult community ministry. I'm also one of the teaching pastors. But we are in a series called Church Defined. And, and what we, our favorite thing here, our currency here is life change. And we love to tell stories of life change. And there are, there are hundreds of stories just like Bobby and Beth here at Fellowship. And we want to tell those stories over and over because it's, it's what we dream about. It's what we love to see. We love to see for people to come to faith in Jesus Christ, to be part of the church family, and then be released into minister where you're gifted and where you're passionate. We're in the, like I said, we're in the fourth week of our Church Defined series. In a couple of weeks, we'll actually start our study of the book of Philippians, and we're really excited about it. Matter of fact, we started selling the journals out in the foyer today. I encourage you to pick one of those up, and we'll do that and start that in a couple of weeks. But we're in the fourth week of our series, Church Defined, and we started off the series, you may, you may remember, four weeks ago, with a simple statement. The church is blank. We've been trying to answer that. And matter of fact, that Sunday, Sam Hannon gave us four metaphors from the scripture. The church is the bride of Christ. The church is the body of Christ. The church is the family of God and the house of God. And then three weeks ago, Caleb Freeman talked to us about the purpose of the church. And we know the purpose of the church ultimately is to glorify God. But what Caleb talked about is to do that, we need to love God and love others and make disciples. And then last week, Sam talked about these biblical functions of the church. That if, you, if you're gonna be part of a church, you need to you make sure it, it has these non-negotiable biblical functions that it can work it out in the philosophy of ministry in different forms, but it, it's gotta have these biblical functions of evangelism and discipleship and fellowship and worship and service. And I would literally lay down in front of your car before you go to some churches that aren't doing these things. One of the blessings in Northwest Arkansas, we've got a lot of churches that are doing these things pretty well. And I think it's reflected in our culture in NWA, don't you? Like God's doing something here. And I, can, I think it's because there are several, a number of healthy churches in this area. And so our, our goal today is we want to answer really two questions, but ultimately one. But the first one is kind of how do we do church here at Fellowship? What's our philosophy of ministry what are our particular forms of ministry? And then this, this big question, what's my role in the church? Or to put it in a statement form, my role in the church is blank. 
And I'd love for you to be able to walk away today and maybe you've you'll had that filled in or maybe you're starting to ask the question and, and you'll have an answer for that in the coming week. But we want you to have a role in the church and we want you to understand what your role in the church is and the part I play or my role is blank. So let's answer the question first. How do we do church? And I think the best answer for it is just in picture form. This is how we do it. We do celebration, we do sell, we ask you to serve. It's really simple. People kind of say, no, 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 that's great, but what else do you guys do? How do you grow? No, we're focused on health. And what we do is we wanna do a large group worship services and we do them over and over and we want you to be a part of it. We think it's so valuable to corporately come together and worship the Lord. And there's something that happens in worship, corporate worship where we begin to see ourselves for who we really are and our values is not maybe not as much as sometimes we think we are or, or maybe if you're struggling in that area, it's more than, but it's all because of Jesus. We see the grace of God just flow and lives being changed. And then we also want you to be involved face-to-face in a small group where you can process life where you can be vulnerable, where you can take off the mask and you can lay your cards on the table and you say, I'm struggling with this. Will you pray for me? The small group is the place where we laugh together and we cry together. We celebrate together. We carry each other's burdens together. We are a celebration cell church. We are a large group worship and a small group based church. And we, we, we base this primarily out of the book of Acts. And I know we looked at this a few weeks ago, but I wanna look at it real quick again. Our strategy is real simple, Acts 2.42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. That's the strategy. It's as simple as that. We just devote ourselves to the study and the teaching of God's word. We, we devote ourselves to this, this idea of, of fellowship. We call it community, but it's fellowship. It's the, the community of the believers to the breaking of bread, which would be communion or, or eating together. Jesus did both at the Last Supper. We'd love for our community groups, our small groups, to do both and to prayer. And then you see the structure built in there in verse 46. The structure is simply this. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts, celebration, large group worship, and they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. It's really simple. Shoulder to shoulder in worship. There's something that happens when we gather together. We're reminded of, of, of God's grace and what he's doing. And then there's something happens when we gather together in small groups. And everything we do at fellowship, or most everything we do, fits in those two categories. And we ask you to serve over and over and over. And then there's a result. Look at this in verse 47. And the result is this, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. You see the result there? There's praising of God. There's joy or they're enjoying each other. Now, some of you might be saying, hey, I've been in community group. I didn't like those people. <laughs> I've been in those groups too. I've probably been that person in the group that people didn't like. We've led those groups. My wife and I, at the, sometimes at the end of the year, you're just like, I'm not sure what that was. <laughs> That's why we give you a summer to kind of take a little break. If that happens over and over, you might want to do a little self-assessment because you may be the problem. But it does take some trial and error. It does take you reaching out and, and, and finding people you like because you don't gel with everyone. It does take some work to find someone you can say, hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you in on something in my life. This is really hard for me. It's hard for me to be transparent, but I'm gonna lay it on the table. Would you help me walk through this? You need those kind of people in your life and you can find those kind of people, hopefully through small groups. And then look at that. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Numerical growth, spiritual growth. And that's what we're hoping for here at Fellowship. We're not focused on growth in numbers. We're focused on church health. But what you see here is there's this natural thing that healthy things tend to grow. Celebration, sell. Large group worship, small group gatherings. Large group worship, small groups in the homes, in conference rooms, 
and coffee shops all over Northwest Arkansas. Here's how it practically looks for us on a Sunday morning. This is a map of our campus. We're currently in the green building in the worship center. Just to the north of us is the family center. Um, In the family center is where our two and three-year-olds meet on the first floor, so we have to keep the young kids down low. Some people wonder why there's different buildings, different people. We've got to keep the young kids on the first floor, and then the third through fifth graders be on the second floor. You know what they do? Large group worship, small group together. They break into the classroom. Look at the preschool building. You see the preschool building? That's just over here. You might wonder, you know, kind of what's going on over there. That's during the week that serves as our kids day out ministry. But what do they do on Sunday mornings? Large group worship, small groups together. Over in the children's center, we've got the youngest kids, the the infants on the first floor. But upstairs, we have um, the kindergarten through second grade. And you know what they do? Large group worship, small groups in the classrooms, over and over. In the student center, we have our sixth graders in Student Center East and our seventh through twelfth graders in the, the rock and roll center over there. You might want to wear your earplugs if you ever go. But they, they meet over there. You know what they do? On Sunday mornings, like adults, they do worship just like us for the whole hour. And then that's where the small group goes to the home. And if you've had kids go through that, that time, it's life-changing. Because those small groups, they, they struggle just like we do, but that's a place for the kids to get real. All right, you've seen our church structure. You're like, is that it? That's it. There's no secret curtain. That's what we do, and we do it over and over and over, year after year after year. And if you're coming to worship and you're not part of a small group, you're gonna feel like something's missing. If you're part of a small group and you don't come to worship, you're gonna feel like something's missing. If you come to worship and you come to a small group, but there's no place for your leadership outlet, for your, your gifts to be expressed, you're not serving anywhere, you're going to feel like something's missing. And I have yet to have somebody that does those three things and just kind of says, man, we just never connected here. This is such a large church, it just didn't work out for us. I have yet to have somebody do those three things and not feel connected not feel part of the mission of the church. I encourage you, get involved. So let's answer the question also, what's my role in the church? And to answer that, we can look at a number of passages. This morning, we're gonna look at 1 Peter chapter two. This is our main text this morning, and we're just gonna work through that. And what's really cool about this passage, I think in this, you'll be able to see what I call the secret sauce of fellowship. It's the one thing that people kind of go, now now tell me about this word in your mission statement. I don't really understand it. It it speaks to a lack of control. And I'm like, yeah, there's a little bit of lack of control here, but God seems to be doing something. Look with me, if you would, at 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. As you come to him, so this is approaching Jesus, the living stone, capital S, Rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him. So it's talking about Jesus and Jesus being the living stone. You see, Peter's trying to teach people in his context. And so building in that context, you would build with stones. And and Peter's saying, Jesus is the living stone. You might remember back in Matthew chapter 16, where um, Jesus says, on this rock, I will build my church. And here, the passage is saying, then Jesus is the rock on which the church is built. Rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him. And then he goes on in verse five, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house. You also like living stones. You think about these stones and being built into a house that each of us is a living stone. You might say, that's me. You also, if you're one of those people who underline their their Bible or highlight or something like that, that's a great word to underline there, you also. Because what he's gonna do in this passage, he's really drawing a line down the middle and he's saying you're either in or you're out. You're either a believer in Christ, and as a believer in Christ, that comes with implications, or you're not a believer in Christ. And what he's doing, he's drawing a line here and he's saying, if you're a believer in Christ, you also, so if you're a believer in Christ, say, that's me. You also, that's me, are like living stones. Like 
like living stones. You're, you're like the capital S stone of Jesus. You're like a living stone who are being built into a spiritual house. Isn't that interesting? I think I've got a picture here of a, of a house. And you see all the different shapes and sizes of stones? That's what the church is like. You can almost think about Peter teach, teaching this sermon, and he's looking at this, this, this stone house, and he's saying, you know, some of you are, are different shapes and sizes. You have different giftings. You have different passions. You're using different ways. But you're like living stones that are being built into a spiritual house, and it got me thinking, so what if that spiritual house, or what if some of those living stones don't show up? Or decide, you know what, I just... I'm gonna watch online from here on out. Or you know what? They don't really need me. It's a big church. There's lots of things going on. It made me think, you ever played Jenga? And you know, you know the blocks? You stack the blocks up and you start pulling them out. And what happens after a while? It starts wobbling, doesn't it? It's actually kind of amazing how long it can stay up, but it's not very sound, is it? You see, unfortunately, I think that's what a lot of churches in America are like today, is people are disappearing from church. And it's some, honestly, some churches I would disappear from too. But we need to show up. And what Peter's saying here is, is like living stones, that you're a stone, you're part of a structure, you, you need to think about yourself in a, in a community type situation, you're part of a structure being built into a spiritual house, but Peter doesn't stop there. He actually gives one of the most challenging things, I think, in the New Testament. Watch this. To be a holy priesthood. You see, as he draws this line, he's saying, you're either in, you believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior, and you're, 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 part, you're a living stone, you're, you're part of the spiritual house, but it doesn't stop there. You're also part of the priesthood. You see, there's no pew sitters. You're either part of the priesthood or you're not a believer in Christ. I think that's a really interesting statement. And I think sometimes as churches, we almost convey that you, you are not part of the priesthood, but you actually are. And here we would say, you're a believer priest. You're, you're, you're part of the ministry. I think there's two really powerful implications. One, one implication is, you don't need me. There's not this clergy lady distinction that to, to approach God, to, to have a relationship with God, you actually don't need me as an intermediary. All we need is Christ. There, there's no name on the sign, and that's intentional, and there never will be. Mickey could decide he wants to be a full-time grandpa, and we would go on. Sam could decide he wants to be a full-time fisherman, and we could go on. They could decide to get rid of me, and we could go on. It's, it's actually kind of humbling, but it's really healthy for an organization because it's not about the individual. It's about Jesus, and we're all part of the priesthood. Matter of fact, do you know what this is? I had to search for it. I found it in the closet near Mickey's office. It's a robe. We used to use these for weddings and stuff. I've actually never worn one in my 20 years on staff. Um, I, well, I not take that back. I put, it on, I put it on just a little while ago to see if it fit. But at, at and this is no shot at our, our high church friends, our, our Lutherans and the Episcopalians and the Catholics. This is not a shot. Actually, there's some really cool stuff that glows along with this. But at Fellowship, what we've chosen to do, Roy, come on up here. I asked Roy to be my example. This is Roy Barsky. Roy and Carol, um, they, they lead everywhere at Fellowship. I mean, Roy, you guys lead in re-engage, is that right? Yeah. And small groups, like community groups, you guys have done everything. And what we do at Fellowship is we put the robe on Roy. And if I'd, have told Carol, if I'd have told Carol earlier, I'd had you come up here too, Carol, but we put the robe on Roy. He teaches in the training center as well. How long have y'all been at Fellowship? Uh, six years. Six, Seven, year. no, six years. She's correcting you? She's correcting you. Yeah, six, yeah. Years. Six, six years. Six years. And they've been leading ever since. You see, when they came to Fellowship, we were actually praying, Lord, would you send us some spiritual leaders? And they showed up. And we put the robe on the Barskis and we say, go. You can do it, we can help. Tell Lord Roy, thank you. And I know that's just an illustration, but that's what we do. 
My role as a pastor is not to put the robe on, it's actually to be your support staff. Our role as staff is simply to to let you be the believer priest that you are and to encourage you and to support you. We love that slogan from, uh, the old slogan from Home Depot, you can do it, we can help. We love that. And it plays out in our mission statement. Our mission statement is to produce and release spiritual leaders who not only know the authentic Christ, but can express the authentic Christ here, near, and abroad. That's what we want to do. We want to produce spiritual leaders, believer priests, who know the authentic Christ, but also over time are trained to, to, to express the authentic Christ to share your spiritual story. Who knows, maybe the next Bobby and Beth are your next door neighbors right now. And all they need to do is be invited in. Hey, come to our table. Hey, come to our group. Hey, let me tell you what God's done in my life. But I wanna wanna also point out a word there, to produce, and this is the one that trips up churches that we talk to all the time, and release. What does that mean? You see, I think that's the secret sauce of this church. It's, it's churches ask, hey, how, can, how do you control all that? Now, we say, we don't. We're actually not even very good at managing it, but we try. It's very organic. We've got groups out there that are meeting that we don't even know about. They say, well, how do you make sure they're teaching the right stuff? You know, it tends to work out, but, but we have a coaching system. We have a strategy but we wanna release you to minister in your area of giftedness and passion and we wanna support you and we wanna train you and we want you to go. We want you to find out what you're gifted at, what you love to do and release you to minister in your area of giftedness and passion. Hey, back to the passage, verse six. For in scripture it says, see I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone. The one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. So he goes back to Jesus. He talks about Jesus being the cornerstone. I think I've got a picture for you, but a cornerstone in building with stones is everything. The cornerstone determines whether something's level. It determines whether it's stable. It determines the strength. It determines um, whether it's true, the, the structure. It determines everything. And Jesus needs to be the cornerstone of your life. And if he's not, he's actually a stumbling stone. You might remember before you received Christ, it just didn't make sense to you. He becomes a stumble stone. It's the same thing in the church, that Jesus needs to be the cornerstone of the church. And he determines the strength of the church and the stability of the church and, and whether the church is, is true and right. And that's what Peter's saying here. And then, As you continue that thought process on, he says, now to you who believe, in verse seven, this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, a stone that causes people to stumble, a rock that makes them fall. And they stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. Here, earlier he was quoting out of Isaiah 28. Here he's quoting out of Psalm 118. And he's, he's talking about this stone. He's either your cornerstone or he's your stumble stone. It either makes sense and he's precious to you or it's nonsense. And then you go on to verse nine. Look at this with me. He goes back to the believer, back to the, the living stones who are being built into a spiritual house or who, are, who are the holy priesthood. He says, but you, say that's me. But you, that's me. Come on, say it with me. But you, that's me. If you're a believer in Christ, every time you see you in this passage, you should say, that's me. But you, that's me. Yeah, that's you. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. Now, I wanna wanna take just a moment here. If If you're here today and you're like, man, this guy is hammering us telling me to lead and serve, and you're like, I'm just trying to get this thing figured out. We're glad you're here. This place is also a greenhouse. And if, you're, if you've got a sin struggle you're dealing with, maybe you're just so wrapped up in porn that you can't see straight, or maybe it's an addiction issue, or maybe it's just whatever's going on, we're just glad you're here. And I want you to see yourself. If you're a believer in Christ, I want you, this is how God sees you. 
Look at the first word, the describing word of each of those statements. You are chosen. You're chosen by God. You are royalty. Underline that. And because of what Jesus done, you are holy. Not because of anything you've done, but because of what Jesus done. You are God's special possession. Your mama always said you're special, didn't she? And now we work really hard to tell you you're not. Well, actually, you are. You're God's special possession. But I want you to look at one more thing with me. There's a reason. That you, say, that's me, that's me. That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Don't you think if we got on uh, Zoom or something with Bobby and Beth in Southeast Asia, you think they'd testify that, man, they're so grateful for that family who reached out to them. And don't you think the people that they are now leading to the Lord, they've got this incredibly strategic ministry they're doing. They're almost like support people and they're working with hundreds. The numbers he was throwing out were mind-blowing. I'm thinking, what if, what if that you, say, that's me, that's me, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Hey, we've got a great example story this morning. If you hadn't heard enough stories already, we've got a great example for you in Keith and Janice Banning. And they talk about a number of ministries here you may or may not be familiar with. Um, one is called Legacy, and it's our, our, it's our ministry to people who watched the Golden Girls growing up, Okay. So if, if you don't know who the Golden Girls are, don't worry about it. It's not for you. But if you know who the Golden Girls are, not on reruns, but original, um, then it's a ministry for you, and it's awesome. You know what we do? Large group meetings and small groups. There's also a ministry called, uh, they mentioned there, called Loving Choices. It's a pregnancy crisis center. That's, it's its own organization, but we support them because we love what they're doing. I think it's actually started in the home of one of our elders, community group type thing. And then also mentions this ministry called Reconnect. And, and it's started by Keith, the husband in this. And I want you just to see how God's used this couple and in amazing ways. Watch this. When you've got something on your heart, you need to continue to pursue it, even if it's not coming together. Uh, if you continue to pursue it, eventually God will put the right person in your path. And that's what happened with Reconnect. God just simply put the right person in my path. When we came to fellowship and we decided this was our church, we, we liked it here, we knew we were gonna like it here. We uh, joined a community group. We've got like the yeah. best people, we just do. the best people in our community group. They're just awesome. Some of our community group had gotten involved in Legacy. It's nothing that we ever even talked about. But I wound up going to that Legacy meeting because I knew that they would be there. After Keith went to that meeting, um, we decided, yeah, we need to really get involved in, in Legacy, and it's been awesome. Reconnect is a music ministry for those suffering with dementia, and the goal is to reconnect those people with the Lord through music. We learned that that's a valid approach because of those organizations that are doing it in the secular world where they're using music therapy to make that reconnection. We actually launched in March of 2023. We've been going now, this August will be our sixth month. We're now in five facilities. We do services probably, I think about 15 or 16 services a month. They'll be singing those songs. Now we're not handing words out, they're just remembering the songs. And it's just absolutely incredible. These are people that, that but for the music, you couldn't convey the thought. I mean, you, it, it's not like you can go into a dementia patient and have a meaningful dialogue with them about the board. But music, I think God hardwired us for music. And that's what they're responding to, is that what God gave us. It's, it's, it's worked out better than I ever imagined it would. My mom had me when she was 16 years of age. The man who would become my dad married her when I was two and adopted me when I was five. When we were sitting in the congregation one day, I saw this video for Loving Choices. 
didn't know anything about loving choices, never heard of them. And I'm like, wow, you know, that's something near and dear to my heart. So I told Keith, we need to make a donation. Then they did the baby bottles where you fill the baby bottles up with the coins. We did that. Yay. All right. I felt like I'm doing my bit for loving choices, right? <laughs> it was probably less than a year later. They showed another video and I had this overwhelming feeling come into my heart and it was God saying that's where I want you to serve so we left church and I told Keith I said uh, I'm gonna go volunteer at Loving Choices I said God's calling me that's where I need to be I've been there a year now and I've had three of my girls graduate since I've been there each and every one of them just holds um, a really special place in my heart all I can say is, you know, if God calls you to do something, if you feel that nudge, if you feel that tug, if you feel that overwhelming feeling like I felt, don't ignore it. You know, go for it. Just because it is true that God does equip the called. You know, you may not think that you are equipped to do what you're being called to do. I certainly didn't. I'm not one of those individuals that God speaks to and says that, you know, do this or don't do that. It, I often say he chooses to remain a silent partner. <laughs> but when you feel that tug or that or, or have that idea or whatever, again, like Janice said, pursue it. I mean, you know, at least discuss it with with people and and staff members and see if it has any merit. And if it does, it'll flourish. Mm -hmm. You know, God will make it flourish. I had a come to Jesus moment here. It was a, a couple of years ago. And I started praying. I prayed that God would use me. When that door opens, you realize how inadequate you are. Uh, I, th I think what it's done is it's reinforced my need to submit to Christ and to rely on Him and His wisdom and let this glorify Him. If you would, hold on to these sheets. Um, we're going to give you the opportunity to fill them out if you want to in the service. If you need a pen, raise your hands and our ushers can kind of bring pens by. But I'll, I'll finish up with this. What a great picture of released leaders. Janice at Loving Choices and Keith, he actually starting a ministry. And don't feel like you have to start a ministry. That's just what God was doing through him. And it's just exploded. I keep, we keep holding him back. It's incredible what God's doing through them as released leaders. And they're fairly new to fellowship. Matter of fact, Keith will be in the, at a booth in the foyer today if you're interested in participating in that Reconnect ministry. We are a Christ-centered community living on mission, to put it as simple as possible. We are a Christ-centered community living on mission. And I want you to be able to answer that question. My role in our church is this. And it simply looks like the pictures we showed earlier, shoulder to shoulder in worship, face to face in small groups, arm in arm in service. Hey, if you would, fill out this, this page today. So to get in a community group, just fill out this, this side. To serve, fill out the other side. Now you may already be serving, you may already be in a community group. If you are, recycle these, just set it on the on the seat. If you need to take it with you, take it with you. We'd love for you to fill it out this morning. And if you do fill it out, would you drop it at the center booth in the foyer? Let us help you get connected. We are a church, a Christ-centered community living on mission. And we want you to play a vital role in that. We need you to play a vital role in that. God bless you, fellowship. Have a great week.